Hello and welcome to the Catch a Lift Coaches Corner. I'm Cal Lead Coach Melissa Luke, and this week I am honored to welcome U.S. Army veteran Dave Cascanti to today's show. Dave is a U.S. Army veteran, a Cal veteran athlete, and also one of the hosts of the Vet Pivot podcast. Welcome to this week's episode of Coaches Corner. Dave, Thank welcome. You. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. It's Super so good awesome. to see you. Same here. All right, Dave, I know we got a lot of stuff we want to talk about today. Why don't we Good jump time. right in? And I want to talk to you a bit about your time in the Army. Okay. Uh, what drove you to enlist in the U.S. Army? Well, I pretty much knew my whole life that I was going to be joining. It was just always a dream. In what capacity, I wasn't exactly sure. You know, it was like a lot of the younger folk, you know, am I going to be Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Army, what, you know, whatnot, just wasn't sure. Um, so I actually did not join right out of high school. Uh, I was actually working in a warehouse and one of the guys who I worked with, he just kept nagging, Hey man, I'm going to be joining up. Sure. It'd be cool. Not just to me, to all of us. Sure. It'd be cool if we all joined together, kept nagging. He kept nagging. Finally, I said, you know what, man? All right. I'll bite. <laughs> I'll go with you. <laughs> so off I went army, army infantry. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Dave, what year was that that you enlisted? So I enlisted in September of 2005. Okay. When you enlisted, did you en enlist with, um, you know, the, did you want to go to war? Was that kind of a part of your plan? Was that a desire? Uh, I wouldn't say so much it was a desire. I knew it was uh, definite that it was going to happen. Um, I understood that, you know, I was absolutely joining at a time when our nation's at war, multiple wars. Um, so I've definitely had a good grasp on, on yeah. the very, very realistic right. um, deployment looming. So. so you would go on to be deployed for 12 months. 15. Would you tell us? 15, I'm sorry, I meant to say 15, 15 months. Would you tell us about that 15 month deployment? Absolutely. So I deployed with Alpha Company 27 Infantry uh, from 3rd ID, which is out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. And we deployed to the Al Anbar province, uh, where we spent the, well, about half of our deployment we spent in a little city called Hit, right along the Euphrates River. Uh, that is just north of Ramadi, uh, where we just, uh, you know, we lived at a train station pretty much for the majority of our time. <laughs> Um, and just, you know, random patrols and, and, and reconnaissance missions and um, guard duty. Everybody gets guard duty. So, yeah. uh, so you know, we did that for a bit, you know, did some open desert patrols. We were mechanized infantry, so we had Bradley fighting vehicles. So our lives revolved around those. Um, and then after that, we moved west to further into the outer reaches of the al -Ambar province to our Rutba, uh, which is right along the Jordan-Syrian border, where we just continued to do similar operations. But in that area, we did a lot more of um, vehicle checkpoint. Okay. Dave, can you kind of walk us through what was a typical day like for you? A uh, typical day, let's say, let's take, for instance, a typical when we're on a rotate, when my platoon was on a patrol rotation, you know, we would uh, just, you know, constantly make sure all your gear is ready to go. All of your ammo is accounted for. You have enough magazines, um, your weapons clean that you're getting in chow when chow arrives. Cause we were somewhat remote. I wouldn't say we were starving by any means, but you know, we weren't getting all the nice fancy deep. Yeah. That, food. So <laughs> that was pretty remote. That was pretty remote uh, where you were. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, might have acquired some stakes <laughs> tactic, very tactically. <laughs> um, so those are maybe cannot confirm or deny getting barbecued. <laughs> oh, jeez. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, when we have downtime, of course, like anyone else, you know, we, you know, play video games or we'd, um, you know, play poker or something like that, you know. But um, aside from that, then, you know, you, we, receive our mission order and go over that and, and 
our route and everything and contingency plans, what our purpose is for this mission and so on and so forth. And then you know, it's either my foot or my Humvee or my Bradley, one of the yeah. three. So Dave, I wanna ask you, you know, what did it mean for you to be a US soldier? Oh, for me to be a U.S. soldier uh, is still to this day, even though I'm out, it still has been one of the most significant moments of my life. Um, I very much love this great nation of ours and believe in it. And to have had the freedom of choice to have enlisted and joined and to represent our nation, um, that's that's a pretty huge thing you know yeah. a lot of nations in this world don't get that opportunity so um you know there's a lot of conscription elsewhere in, in in the world and so to really get the opportunity to represent our nation is just something nice to this day hold near and dear to my heart i i still try to lead, live by what i've learned uh, in terms of camaraderie and, and leadership and things of that sort so it's definitely the most impactful um era of my life yeah yeah i can i can definitely relate to that myself too right <clears throat> so dave on christmas eve 2008 you were the lone survivor of a horrific murder suicide involving your your then girlfriend can you tell us about that experience absolutely um so yeah as you mentioned it was uh christmas break of 2008 and I went off to visit my then girlfriend. And it was, uh, you know, we were met with some hostility to begin with from her ex. And, you know, he was doing things like keying my car and, you know, making it apparent that he didn't agree with the relationship and so on and so forth. And, uh, yeah, it, you know, it got to the point where, you know, I'm not even 100% certain if it was drug induced or just complete anger or, or what be it. But, you know, um, he, let's see, we were planning on going to her mother's house and luckily, and I say luckily because, you know, in these situations, you definitely never want to have children involved. Right. And so, right. um, luckily, uh, the children and her sister, uh, went off to that house. And so at that time, it was just the two of us and we were getting ready to go hop in the car. And then we kind of, you know, we heard, we heard tires and next thing you know, the door gets kicked in and he pointed the gun at her. And at that point I, you know, was still kind of fresh from deployment, even though, you know, I hadn't been in any intense combat situations. I think you still just, you know, you, you retain some of that training always oh, for absolutely. life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the reflexes were definitely there. You know, I, I spotted a gun, I recognized the immediate threat and, you know, went to push her out of the way. And instead, uh, I was shot in the face, um, on my right mandible. So, you know, the beard's kind of hiding it a bit, but this is all, this is a titanium plate and, um, the, the bullet, the round impacted on my mandible and um, fragmented bone and the round itself fragmented and it's just peppered throughout my neck Oof. for life. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I grabbed her and, and we, we got into my truck and drove off. I was unfamiliar with the territory, uh, didn't know the roads also at the time recognized that I was likely bleeding out, you know, right. I just wasn't, wasn't too sure of how severe the wound was, but I knew I needed right. to tend to it. And so, yeah, uh, we kind of did a quick fire drill and switched places and so that I could tend to my wounds and we drove off and right about when we switched, he, he had gotten into his car and, and caught up and was, you know, pointing at each other. So as we passed him, he fired off a few more rounds, the windshield deflected it. Um, but then, then we went down the highway and whatnot. And, you know, again, you know, I'm a little more used to high intense situations than she was. Right. And so he caught up and was ramming us from behind and was shooting out the, the back window. And, you know, um, she kind of panicked and 
straightened our arms out and he ran us off the road and we crashed in through some trees and whatnot. And, and we, you know, kind of shook it off as best as we could and, and got out and started running, but, you know, he caught up and, um, yeah, he just kind of pointed the gun at her and, and, uh, took her life and then he turned it upon himself and took his own life and thus leaving me as a lone survivor. Um, and you know, unfortunately leaving, uh, her precious two daughters and son behind. And, uh, yeah, then, then came a whirlwind of 10 years or so of oh my gosh. just road to recovery. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are, you know, there's, there's no words, you know, to really respond to that. Um, yeah. it's, so let me kind of ask you about that, Dave, you know, you're the lone survivor of this, this horrific crime that has, uh, has occurred, you know, what did the immediate kind of months and early years look like for you coming off of that? Um, and these are, I've told this so many times over the years, and I just want to, I just want to point this out. I've told this so many times over the years. Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I, I every time I tell it, I, I, I've gotten more used to telling it to begin to begin with, but you know, as, as I tell them, I always start to recount more and more things that maybe the last, the previous time I didn't recall. But um, the coming months, I mean, so initially, um, I wasn't even certain that uh, that she was dead at the time. Um, you know, I, I I went to go get help, and I was knocking at doors and um, and whatnot. Um, it was Christmas Eve. So, you know, most people weren't home. Um, I do recall one home in particular that they were home and it's still to this day, you know, I, I feel terrible for the woman, you know, uh, having a peaceful dinner and she opens the door to find, you know, me bleeding and, and yeah. she's horrified. Of course, she's, yeah. she's let, right. slammed the door in my face. I hold no ill will towards her whatsoever. I probably yeah. would do the same, you know, well, maybe not, but <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, and so I, I eventually made my way back around to one of the, um, first homes and the gentleman who owned that home, his family had come out, I guess they'd been upstairs and he'd been in his field and came in and they actually tended to me the whole time I was actually on the phone with 911, but also I was on the phone with my team leader because the army ingrains in you. Yeah. If you're in trouble, call your team. Leader. Right, right. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking this random civilian on how to tend to my wounds. You know, hey, I, I, I'm telling you right now, my body's about to go into shock. Yeah. And this is what you're going to need to do for me, and this, and this, and this. And they did it all, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but then, you know, they took me to the hospital um, in a helicopter, um, and. I just remember, you know, just really being out of it. You know, obviously the paramedics had given me medicine for the pain. So, you know, aside from the initial shock and then now the medication, you know, I just kind of was really out of it. Not, not even too certain, like, um, is she alive? Is she not? I remember her family coming mm -hmm. to visit me, um, and asking me and I had no idea. And, uh, but yeah, upon the realization that, you know, that her life had ceased. Um, that was, that was incredibly devastating. Um, you know, uh, I, in my life have been around a lot of people dying, you know, but I've never obviously had somebody who was so close to me, who I cared about, um, pass, uh, especially not in such a violent manner. Right. Um, so that was, it's definitely initially traumatic, but I think, you know, maybe because, not maybe, more than likely because of the, the culture of, of being infantry and everything, just, you know, shake it off, you're fine. Shake right. it off, you're fine. Right. So I would say actually my first, my first few months back, and, and I think you'll find this pretty common across the board when, when, when military members experience incredible amounts of trauma, um, 
that's what we do. We we just find a corner of our of our mind to put it in, yeah. and yeah, you know, I'll deal with yeah. it later. I'll deal with it yep. on my own time. And it's unfortunate that that's our that's our our culture, um, right? So I mean, the first few months, you know, I I was in a lot of serious physical pain, but you know, I didn't want to appear that I wasn't. So I was right out there playing football. I was out there back to running, um, trying. Yeah. But you know, deep down inside, knowing I, I'm not going to be able to do this too long. This this mask is going to wear off here soon. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it did catch up to me. You know, it did. Um, uh, and you could talk to any of my leadership at that time, and they will more than likely tell you, "Yep, he definitely changed after that." Yeah. You know, my my desire to want to be at work was gone. Right. I didn't care anymore. I know I I was in it in my mind at the time for the long haul, twenty plus years. Um, is what I wanted to do, and at that point, I was just done. Yeah. Didn't didn't care anymore. Didn't didn't want to even think about getting promoted or anything of that sort. Yeah. Um, so it was it was rough <laughs> to say the least. Um, and uh, so you know, I was uh, tending to all of my uh, wounds by myself. Uh, at the time, I had very few people actually come and help me out. The ones that did, I'm eternally grateful for, but you know, it wasn't their day job to come and cook for me and yeah. clean for me. So um, what they ended up doing, I'm sorry, I'm kind of bouncing all no, over. No, it's all right. It's all right. No, no, so don't apologize. What they, uh, what they ended up doing was, you know, they, they put the titanium um, mandible plate, if you will, um, on my right mandible. And then to immobilize them, they essentially put braces on my teeth and wired my mouth shut to where I couldn't oh open my mouth. So, I mean, in that short period of about a month to five weeks, you know, I, I went from almost 200 pounds, just dropped down to 162, 163 pounds in a month because yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't obviously open my mouth to consume solids. Right. So it was mostly a diet of, and I still kind of cringe at them nowadays, but it was just a diet of those little bottled protein um insure type things yeah um and, you know i had to get creative because i said you know i can't i can't just keep losing weight here you know yeah. so you know it's gonna sound gross and i'm sorry people but sometimes <laughs> you just gotta do what you gotta do i would brace yourself for this i would take things like the raviolios or whatever um uh, the stuff ravioli chef for ids and i would blend it yeah i'd blend it just to get that meat and yeah, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's gross. It still is gross. I probably wouldn't do it now. But, <laughs> um, I definitely needed it. You know, I needed yeah. that protein. I needed to stop dropping so much weight because I was weak. I was so incredibly weak from, from the weight loss, from dealing with the mental anguish as well. Right. Um, so, I mean, it was, I still think about that initial healing period very often in that um, it's important for us, you know, if I could talk to myself back then in the healing process, I would really point out to myself, you gotta be okay with people wanting to help you. Yeah, You really do. Like you can't just do it all by yourself and you have right. to be open within yourself to say, Hey, I do need help. I need, I need a lot of help. Will you please? Yeah. So, you know, so during that early time, you know, you're in just excruciating physical pain and mental pain. Um, what kept you going, Dave? What, you know, who or what did you look to to keep you going? And, you know. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag of answers in that, you know, my whole life I've been a man of faith. And at that time, I, I very much found myself questioning my own faith. I found myself questioning the existence of our heavenly father. And, but it was like a battle, you know, it was like one day I would, one day I wouldn't. Right. Um, I really think 
that alone and a lot of the lessons I had as a child growing up in church just really whether I really wanted to admit them to my admit them to myself at the time you know I really think they were they were instrumental in that you know um because I you know I'm not ashamed to say it. there were several days where I was just moments from taking my life away yeah. um you know I don't ever shy away from that um because it's it's a road I don't want to go back down right so, yeah know, we, so you know I just really always emphasized in, to myself you know it's just not that's not that's not the road we need to go down um so even though I was like right there ready to do it just no no I I, I need to just stop and I need yeah. to just pray right now and so I would I'd pray I'd I'd call my parents I'd Call my brother, you know, I'd, um, even at the time I'd call my ex-wife, you know, just, they were just people who were familiar to me. Right. And, uh, but I also had my dog and, you know, it's, it's amazing what an animal can actually do for you to calm you down. And oh, so absolutely. I'm grateful for him. And of all the things, that's actually what's almost getting me to tear up right now. But um, that's just because we put him down last year, but, uh, but that was incredibly significant for me is, you know, he, he would, you know, they just, they sense it, you know, they, they just sense it and he would come up. Uh, I remember one time in particular, he just, he was in his kennel and he broke out. He broke out and he, he ran and he, he laid himself right in my lap. And I was <laughs> just like, uh, guess I can't, you know? So, <laughs> so, I mean, but overall, I would definitely say faith yeah. is, is what kept my focus. Yeah. Dave, uh, when you and I met, you know, before the show and we're kind of talking about your episode, you said something to me like this from some, from something so horrific a person can go on to do great things. So, you know, looking back at this tragedy now, you know, several years removed from it now, what have you taken away from that experience? You just got to work. And when I say work, I, I, I say you, you got to work on yourself and you got to not be, you, you just can't be shy. Um, if you're If you're going through therapy, then you have to just, really, really take a moment, a lot of moments really, and tell yourself, you know, I'm, I'm here to heal. And this person, I may think that they're judging me, but they're, they're really not. They, they're trying to help with teaching you the tools that you need to truly continue with life because you, you really do have to carry on in life. And yeah. that's not to say you need to keep it all inside. So, what it's really taught me is life can and will suck at times. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have some moments that are just worse than others and some that aren't. And through all of them, I just think you really got to, whatever it is that has driven you, you have to focus on that and you have to just keep clawing away. I mean, if you just, if you think about it in, in terms of, you know, most of us have been through through basic training or boot camp of some sort, and I would assume that all branches, to some degree, have that that night crawl through the mud. You know, we you know, <laughs> in the army, you know, yeah. we call it the night infiltration. You know, so you know, you just got to think of it like that. But like that sucked. Yeah. Like, there's no denying that sucked. And you know, you got sand everywhere, you got mud everywhere. It's cold. It's it's wet, and it feels like you're not going anywhere. But if you moved even an inch forward, then you're just that inch closer to reaching that goal. And it's going to feel like that a lot. It's going to suck. And, and you're going to have to relive a lot of it. And it's unfortunate that, that, that you do. But ultimately, the goal is to um, lead yourself to that recovery mode. Um, and, that, you know, it's just it's funny because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I co-host on Vet Pivot with Matt Kuchera. And it, it's these things, it's like I kind of lived them already, but he really he really pushes them on the show. 
And, and he's been pushing them so much lately that I've really come to realize, you know, that's kind of exactly what I've been doing over these past 10 years, getting to the point to where I, where I wasn't to where I am. And, you know, you lead yourself, you lead your family and you lead your community and slowly, but gradually over the course of 10 years, it's just, I've, I've come out of this hole this yeah. century um, to where I had to accept, you know, it's hard. You have to accept you're, you're not that same person you were before something happened to you and you never will be. And that's okay. That's the hardest part. I think is just yeah. saying it's okay. I'm not going to be. Oh, absolutely. Person. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I need to redefine myself and I need to work with what I've got. And what I've got is the ability to take this tragedy, take this horrible moment in my life and turn it around and hopefully help others along the way that because mine's not the worst tragedy on earth. It's not, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it was terrible for myself. And I think yeah. sometimes we forget like what was somebody else's worst tragedy to you might not be, but for them it was. And so I think that's where it becomes really important to speak about it openly and, and say, Hey, I don't fully understand what you as an individual went through, yeah. but a lot of what you're feeling from it, I do. And I'm here. And I think that's really just been one of the most helpful things along the way is just trying my best <laughs> yeah. to help those along the way. Um, and I really feel like it's, it's, it's really picking up a lot more now. And I, I feel like I'm able to help a lot more people I'm able to talk about this a whole lot um, easier now. Yeah. Um, it's definitely helped my family life a whole lot um, in that now, you know, I'm, I'm able to take my family out places yeah. um, and focus on them, really, really focus on them in the moment. And so, yeah, I'm kind of long winded. <laughs> no, no, that's thank you so much for, for, for sharing all of this with us, Dave, and, you know, talking to us about this stuff. So, you know, as you and I both know, I mean, bad days come dark times, you know, and this, you know, it might go on days can last into weeks. And how do you push forward now, Dave, you know, a bad day comes or, you know, string of days, how do you keep pushing through that? Or how do you kind of break out of that? I definitely have my bad days still. Like there's, there's no denying. And I think, yeah, I think that's something we maybe sometimes unrealistically reach for is this, this illusion that we're never going to have bad days ever again. Yeah, I could get right. to this point where I'm never going to have yep. a bad day again. And it's just completely unrealistic and you have to expect them and you have to arm yourself with the tools to, to get over those days. And so your question is, how do I get over those days? And when I first got out and went back, back home, I, was very blessed to have a amazing um, girl that I am now married to. <laughs> uh, she's been super, super amazing this whole time in understanding and being patient, being loving. And she was actually the one who pushed me to go to the VA and, and okay. get help. And, and then came my next blessing in that I had a therapist that actually and most do so i don't want to put a bad name out there or a bad image but most therapists do care but like any job you're obviously going to always yeah. have a few that you know don't necessarily right there as much but ultimately the majority of therapists do um anyways she truly truly is passionate still to this day about helping veterans and and helping them unlock themselves, you know, and finding those tools. And so I went to therapy by myself. I went to therapy with my wife um, and just really learned a lot about myself, learned about our, our, you know, us as a couple, how to get over hurdles along the way. 
Um, she really didn't just arm me, but she armed my wife with awesome weaponry of how to get through these moments and to be open and discuss them with each other and stop before you get to that moment of really, you know, going off on each other. Right. And, you know, um, so I really would say always number one for me, instrumental uh, on my bad days is faith. I will stop and I will pray and we'll pray as a family and, you know, um, we'll find verses um, to read together. Um, so that that's always going to be number one for us. Yeah. Um, number two is that we really just, we talk. We are constantly talking. My wife and I, we communicate. I could probably look at my phone right now and there's probably any messages <laughs> from her of what they're out there doing right now. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we just, it's constant communication, whatever it is, whether we're having happy moments, bad moments, you know, sad, whatever, you know. Um, so that's all on that side. But additionally, you know, I, I've gotten involved with, um, well, with Catch a Lift initially. Um, that was one of the biggest blessings when y'all came, came into my life and, and really, really cemented a new foundation yeah. for me to, to now get in shape, find that, um, the word escapes me, that uh, confidence that I needed to find, a renewed yeah. confidence. So, and again, not, not going back because we have yeah. to stop focusing so much on the past. So I, I found a renewed confidence. You know, I lost 30 pounds. I, I, I got in shape. I started ruck marching again and, and lifting and, and running sometimes, but I'm not the biggest fan <laughs> of running. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, I, it just all kind of came, you know, catch a lift. Then I got involved with Lazy Lab Hunting Club. I went out on a hunt with them. And what's great about them is that is also a faith-based organization. Um, you know, we're not out there, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya, you know, but we'll get up in the tree stand and we'll do, we'll do that thing. And, and, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, if it prevent, presents itself, then we'll definitely have open conversations about Christ. But, you know, it's not, it's not with a purpose to preach. It's, it's with a purpose to let's, let's, let's do it like we did, you know, when you're in the squad and you're just, yeah. with, with with your brothers and your sisters and you and you're just chatting away about whatever you know because we'll do that after after we get down from the tree stand we'll go to a camp around the campfire and we'll just chat and if you remember those conversations when you were in that's what we're doing yeah, that, yeah. that's just it it's just randomness you know um and then you know matt from vet pivot he wouldn't take no for an answer <laughs> he pretty much told me I have to, I have to co-host with it. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, no you know, they're all, they're all great guys and, and what they're doing and how they're doing. And it keeps me, it keeps me busy a lot. You know, I'm not being compensated for any of it. Um, aside from the, the price tag that you just can't put a number on that, you know, it's all, working towards healing others, which in turn is, is healing me, you know, I'm. Oh, absolutely. And so, absolutely. You know, I, I, I see people who are at the beginning of their, their journey with it. And I just kind of say, you know, I know now I, now I know yeah. you can absolutely overcome this and you can do great things and you can get to a point where, where you feel, like you do matter again, because you do everyone, every one of you matters. And, and you really need to be real with you about with yourself about that. Oh my gosh. There's so much great stuff that you just said there. I want to, you know, highlight a, highlight a couple things and then definitely want to talk about, you know, your other ventures and whatnot. But, um, so something I think, and I know I'm guilty of it, and I have to actively fight against it, you know, when, when bad times come, you know, I want to shut down, you know, right. I want to, you know, tend to push, you know, my family away and such. Um, so I think that's just, you know, wonderful that, 
you know, that's such a focal point of your guys' relationship, that open, constant communication, you know, whether it's it's good times or not. And I think that's right. that's definitely a lesson for all of us. Oh, yeah. You know, the the more that, you know, we can talk through this and not just bottle it down and, you know, shove it in that compartmentalized yep. spot. Um, same thing, you know, your your faith in Jesus Christ and, you know, the peace and hope that that's brought you in your life. I mean, I think it's just so vitally important that we have something beyond ourselves, you know? Absolutely. Um, so I want to, you know, kind of sh shift gears here a little bit because I want to talk to you, you know, about Catch a Lift and Lazy Lab and that pivot. So let's talk about Catch a Lift. Um, okay. How did you learn about Catch a Lift? How did, you know, how'd you learn about it? What made you decide to commit and apply? So that's pretty interesting, actually. Um, I used to work in nonprofit out in San Francisco. Um, I'm not going to drop their name, but, um, and so my job was, I was an intake um, specialist case okay. manager, and I would assess either, most of the time it was homeless veterans, and I would assess them, assess them for employability. Okay. And then I would send them off to training uh, to get trained up so that they're, um, they'd look a little prettier on resumes. And I would, <laughs> I came across Catch a Lift a long time ago, uh, 2014, I believe. Okay. And <clears throat> 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. And uh, I would always recommend it to all of the, all of the <laughs> veterans that came through. Um, I even recommended it to a bunch of the guys I served with. And there, I think a few of them, um, for, uh, giving grants as well. Uh, that's awesome. And I never, I never pursued it for myself. You know? <laughs> I just always telling people about, Hey, you should check, check them, out, check them out. And, and then finally my wife said, you know what? Years you've been sending people left and right, go to catch a lift, go to catch a lift. And you're seeing how their quality of life is improving. Are you hearing me yet? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And so, totally. so yeah, you know, she's, ah, she's been so great over all these years and I'm sure for the rest of our lives, we'll continue to be that catalyst to push me that little bit to, you know, just take that plunge. Yeah. Uh, and so, you, you know, she, she finally got it through to my head because I could be kind of cold <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I took the plunge and I, I, I uh, I signed up. <laughs> So you've lost uh, around 30 pounds since joining Catch a Lift. Talk yes, to me about, um, you know, talk to me about your experience since you've been in Catch a Lift and, um, you know, what, what that's brought to your life. Um, you know, it, it, it's been nothing short of amazing. And from the get-go, I mean, I got approved for the grant and it was just one phone call after an email, another phone call, an email, and just... Everybody was just making sure that that everything was being taken care of, and and um, then the, the the gym itself, because I I was approved for the home gym, and so the rack, the squat rack came, the bench came, the weights came. You know, I'm just watching it all come in with just you know like a little kid at Christmas, just absolute excitement because yeah, lifting weights was something I um, enjoyed a whole lot when I was active duty. I mean, it was definitely something that was missing. You know, I tried it a few times um, after I got out and just uh, the vibe at the gym sometimes is not always yeah. the best or, you you know, you're stuck waiting on that person doing curls in the squat rack, and, you know, <laughs> just come on. Uh, so, you know, it's just the ability to just wake up and do it and not have to drive anywhere. Um, it was just super motivational. And then, along the along the way you know your husband is amazing by the way yeah. uh, i know you know this yes right? he is <laughs> um you know it just he was he was really key in in my early phase you know just yeah I, I would bounce ideas off him i would ask him for advice and and he never missed a beat you know he just was always there still is not a was he still is yeah. um and so I would say a lot of my routines were altered or adjusted to 
some of what he was doing. Um, he made an amazing suggestion about keeping a journal, a log book. Yes, yes. And at first, you know, I even told him, I said, ah, <laughs> no, infantry and writing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll try it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I tried it. And yeah, it was, it's great. You know, you definitely see that progress, you know. Oh, you totally. Start totally. Start out and you're like, oh, man, that's not a whole lot of weight. But, <laughs> you know, so. It's, uh, yeah, everybody's just been amazing and just super happy to interact with everybody. And they're always so happy to interact back, which is really, really unique um, yeah. for a nonprofit. Like, right. Very, yeah. very unique. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I'm going to take this moment to do my shameless plug for uh, workout logging because <laughs> uh, David and I, you know, we live and breathe our workout logs, our training logs, and we have for the past, you know, four or five years. And, you know, definitely to anybody that's listening, if you're training, you know, you need to be keeping a log of some sort, either paper and pen. We've got the Catch a Lift fitness app that you can now, you know, if you'd prefer to do it digitally, but it's just vitally important. And we all start somewhere, right? And it tells such a beautiful tale as you go week by week, month, into the years. I mean, it's absolutely incredible to look back at. So oh, yeah. I'm glad he, I'm glad he made you a believer there. Oh, yeah. Especially <laughs> that little section at the bottom where it says notes. Yes. And I really want to emphasize, you really should fill that out. What you were feeling that day, what your yeah. mood was and, and, and how you succeeded that day. Yeah. And I, I really think when you look back and you should look back on your logs and, and see, especially those notes, not just those numbers, but those yeah. notes. Like, oh man, I overcame that. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's terrific. Yep. Log books, people. Log yes. Books. <laughs> Get your logs going. <laughs> so, you know, also when you and I got to talk here a couple weeks ago, I had the pleasure of meeting your wonderful wife. Right. And, you know, one of the things she brought up is, you know, how great, obviously not only that the fitness has been for you and, you know, the equipment you got from Catch a Lift, but watching your children get in there and move yeah. around with you and do stuff. So talk to me about the impact, you know, that your physical fitness has had on, you know, your wife, your children, your whole family. Yeah, that's been, that's been super cool as well. You know, my, my wife, she definitely, she loves fitness as well. Um, I'm not going to put numbers out there for her, but she's, she's definitely shed a lot as well, um, which I'm super proud of her for because she's, she's stuck to it a lot better than I have. <laughs> so, but it's, it's been super cool watching the kids as well. You know, just, you know, I'll wake up sometimes and, you know, they're not touching the actual weights themselves. They understand that that's, that's, that's the line. You don't yeah. pick up the actual heavy weights, but they will sit there and do push ups. They'll do sit ups. They'll grab, you know, like their little toy dinosaurs yeah. and pretend that they're <laughs> dumbbells. And, you know. I love it. So it's just been really cool. And like, you know, my daughter, she'll grab, she's four years old. She'll grab her backpack, throw it on and say, you know, I'm ruck marching like you. And it's like, oh man, that's so cool. This is oh, cool. My gosh. So, you know, we think of it as just like, oh, it's cute. It's everything. But really what you're doing is you're setting it up for them yes. In, yes. Their, in their minds that, you know, you're, you're going to, like I said earlier, you're going to have bad days. Yep. But something you can control is how much you exercise and how amazing it's going to help you feel after your workout's done. And so I think it's awesome that they are already getting this idea of uh, exercise and how important it is. So, Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It, you know, and right at first you think, oh, that's, you know, it's so cute. They're, you know, trying to be like mommy or daddy, but, and then you right. realize like, no, you're, you're mapping this blueprint for them. And yep. it's just absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So yeah. that's terrific to hear. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about lazy lab hunting club. You know, Alrighty. you've expressed, you know, what a great organization it is and how much, you know, the outdoors has positively impacted your recovery. You know, so, so talk to us about, about Lazy Lab and, and the outdoors. So Lazy Lab Hunting Club was created in 2008. Um, one of the co-founders, uh, he and I actually went to high school together, um, which also includes my wife because we went to high school together as well. So the three okay. of us, we know each Very other. Very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt Mitchelson is his name. And... Um, like I said, he was a co-founder. He's currently the president of the organization. Um, 
and it came about because of um, because of the loss of somebody else that we went to high school with that was in the Marine Corps. Um, and so Matt was Matt and his friends uh, were left wondering, you know, what can we do? How can we how can we help? How can we give back? And they came up with this idea of Lazy Lab Hunting Club. And the idea is to take not only veterans, but we'll take out um, active duty wounded warriors okay. um, and their families um, when the opportunity presents itself. And we will do, sometimes we'll do a combo hunt where we'll do deer and hog. Um, we have some other ones that are just deer. Um, we're working on some fishing expeditions as well. Very uh, cool. what, what we have right now that's super unique is that we've actually partnered with Freedom Service Dogs of America, where we are now able to provide a completely free service dog to a veteran in need. Wow, that's um, terrific. Yeah, all expenses paid. And, um, you know, it's not it's not a 100% guarantee, you know, like with anything, there's an application yep. process you have to follow that you have to adhere to that. Um, you have to be in communication with Freedom Service Dogs right. in America. Um, but ultimately, yeah, um, they will even fly. And so internally, we, we refer to all candidates as heroes, rightfully so. Yep. Um, they will fly the hero out to Colorado, where they're based out of, to meet their dog, to see if they're a good fit for compatibility, to understand how their... Um, commands work with the dogs, what the dogs can and cannot do, and so on and so forth. They'll also pay for the annual checkups for the dog and in the, you know, eventual, like any animal, um, death of the, right. of the service dog, uh, they'll replace it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we're, you know, we're currently, we're planning on our first hunt coming in, in November. Okay. Uh, for this year, I should say. Uh, and then, you know, we, we have a couple hunts coming thereafter. Um, and as we're just always fundraising as well. So, you know, yeah. donations, um, are pretty awesome because we operate on a 96% nonprofit. Nobody in the organization's paid. So 96 cents of every dollar goes right back into, um, providing for the hunts and equipment and so on and so forth. That's terrific. Uh, Dave, for any veterans listening, you know, that want to get involved with uh, Lazy Lab or learn more about it, where can they find that information? So our website is lazylabhc.org, but we can also be found on all major social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and we even have a LinkedIn where you could connect with us. Um, you know, we're constantly putting out content. Like I said, we've got some hunts coming up here soon. So um, we're genuine, genuinely growing some excitement over that, you know, and we'll be putting out bios of our participants here soon so that y'all can meet them. That's terrific. That's terrific. Um, so you guys check out Lazy Lab Hunting Club. Let's talk about Vet Pivot, Dave. Yes, ma'am. So first, tell us about the podcast, um, you know, kind of what it's about or what the aim of the podcast is. So the aim of the podcast with Vet Pivot, um, you know, I was not at all an originator of that either. <laughs> that was all Matt Kuchera, uh, who is an Air Force veteran. And I forgot to mention about Matt Mitchelson with Lazy Lab. He's actually uh, currently active duty Navy. Okay. Um, but Matt Matt Kuchera, I have a lot of mats in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt Kuchera is an Air Force veteran, and, and um, he started up Vet Pivot and with the purpose of helping that transition process of, yeah. of what do I do now? You know, I'm out, what do I do? And yeah. more often than not, our hope is obviously, you know, to catch the individual before they get out. So they can kind of get a good idea of what they should be doing, where they should be looking for help and, you know, what they should be really focusing on. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the main three tenets we focus on is lead yourself, lead your family and lead your community. And, Awesome. We absolutely, we, we either hit on all three during one episode or, you know, 
one episode will focus on one tenant particular. Um, but we definitely get um, a wide variety of guests on the show. And not all of them are veterans themselves, but in some way, shape, form, impact the veteran community. That's so awesome. And you came on as one of the hosts at the start of season two. Um, tell me what the experience has been like, you know, being a host on a podcast, you guys are putting right. out two shows a week, you yeah. know, tell us about what that experience has been like. Well, I came on on episode 71 and if you watch it, I'm sorry. Cause the majority of the time I'm just doing this. <laughs> <laughs> just a deer in uh, headlights. And, uh, <laughs> I know that feeling, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, I think we're coming up on, We've done 12 together. We've done, I think, 12 episodes, 13 episodes. Um, and I'm definitely a lot more myself now. Uh, yeah. I am not known as Dave on the show. <laughs> Matt has apparently dubbed me Dynamite. Yes. And that is all that my name says on the screen during recordings, Dynamite. He said it jokingly the first episode and it has just stuck. And you know what? I <laughs> kind of like it. So we ran with it. My I like it too. Uh, Dynamite Dave. I like it. Yeah. So, totally. Yeah. That's awesome. And for so where can folks connect with Vet Pivot? So with Vet Pivot, we can the website is vetpivot.com. Um can also be found on all major social media platforms, Instagram. Um, as Vet Pivot on Facebook, we have two actually. We have Vet Pivot, and then for just the veterans, we have Vet Pivot Nation. Um, that one we do a little bit more interacting as veterans, as opposed to just you know um, the advertising side of things. You know, we we ask a lot of questions. We we try to engage the community as well, um, and we also allow veterans to post uh, of their own. Uh, businesses and such, or, or um, community uplifting type videos, or what be it. Um, and then we're also on LinkedIn. Awesome. awesome. But just want to throw this in there real quick. You know, what do you got, Dave? Season one was all audio podcast. Okay. And season two is where Matt decided to introduce. Uh, video. So we are on YouTube and that is our main push right now because I okay. really feel that people are really missing out by not actually watching. Because yeah. There are a lot of funny things uh, that you just can't translate through just audio. <laughs> you know, you can't see a knife yeah. through audio. So <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I encourage y'all find it on, <laughs> on YouTube. So that's terrific. Um, Man, you've got you've got some great stuff going on in your life, Dave. You've got some I'm great busy. stuff going. I am you busy. Are busy. And Good I love grief. it all because I am outdoors a lot because of both of these, because actually both are strategically partnered. And so that's been kind of neat as well, you know, just to kind of have the two things that I'm really involved in to be more or less under the same umbrella. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, but it's really gotten me outdoors a lot. Uh, it's gotten my family outdoors a lot. My my kids and my wife, they love to fish as well. I, I'm a, so obsessed with fishing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, it's been great, you know, watching, because we moved to Georgia three years ago and we were not too big into doing fishing or hunting or anything like that. And now watching our son, um, it was just, just the two of us, my son and I, we went on to Fort Gordon, which we lived near Fort Gordon. And they had a kid's derby and he hauled out his first fish and just oh, watching man. his sheer excitement as he just reels that thing. Oh in, my gosh. Yeah. You know, big old 22 inch catfish. And it's just, man, that nothing oh, beats that. You know, oh a, my gosh. And then two minutes later, he hauls out another one, same size. <laughs> like, kid, I, I'm done fishing. I'm retired. Oh, no kidding. Right. <laughs> you're winning this competition. <laughs> Oh, that's so awesome. The yeah. outdoors, you know, it's really interesting, the hunting, fishing, hiking, you know, whatever it is that you yeah. do connect with outdoors, it, it's such a, you know, unique, yeah. um, you know, therapy or healing, you know, that we can find through it. Absolutely. Um, I've always kind of, for myself, looked at it almost like a, because my training, you know, I've always said is my, my it's also, 
you know, the time that I'm able to spend outdoors, you know, right. hiking, hunting, fishing. Um, and, you know, if, if one of them I don't have in my life, you know, I can definitely feel a bit unbalanced. So oh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's absolutely terrific. Oh, yeah. Outdoors so, are important. Dave, I want to make sure we ask you to, where can, where can everybody connect with you? If anybody wants to connect with you further too. Well, my PayPal, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> get your pen and paper out. <laughs> get your pen and paper out. I take <laughs> checks and all need them, credit cards. Um, no. Uh, so I am on Instagram um, and, and that's, that's my primary way of reaching out uh, through social media. Um, I'm dynamite underscore Dave Cascante. You, you're probably going to need some help spelling that C A S C A N T E. Um, and so that's my main way to be found on social media. I am on LinkedIn uh, as David or Dave Cascante. Um, if you would like to reach me through Vet Pivot, it's Dave at vetpivot.com. Or if you'd like to reach me through Lazy Lab Hunting Club, then it's Dave at lazylabhc.org. And I hope to hear from y'all. Absolutely. Well, Do reach out. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, Dave is a, a fantastic person to talk to. That's yeah. a, you know, you put that out. So, you know, reach out, definitely. Um, first of all, Dave, you know, thank you for your service to our great country. And thank you so much for the continued service you keep giving to our wonderful veteran community and, you know, the, the zeal that you keep pushing forward for our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank and you as well. It's, it's absolutely an honor to talk with you today and um, definitely excited to continue following your journey. Yeah. Thank you again for your service and for you as well. Continue to help the community. It's super awesome. Absolutely. So that's it for this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We will return next Wednesday at 1 Eastern with another new episode. Thank you again, Dave, for sharing your story and your light with us today. It was absolutely phenomenal. Really? Thank you to ID Technology for your continued support of Catch a Lift, uh, the Coach's Corner podcast, the website, the landing zone. Thank you to Lynn Coughlin, Kaylee Nasiri, Henry Pomper uh, for all your back end support of this podcast and making sure that we can continue to put it on. And thank you to the entire CAL team. If there are any veteran members listening today that would like to jump on and talk a bit more with Dave after the show, leave your name in the YouTube chat box and we'll get you guys sent a link. And until next week, keep it real and stay CAL strong. I know.